thank you all for coming on this lovely evening. Um, we're going to tell you the story about the greening of the Arctic. And I guess we're calling it the Tapas or the Whitman Sampler, because the scientists who've done the work will each tell you the story, because we think that's the best way for you to learn about it. And the other thing we'd like you to get out of it is the joy of multidisciplinary research. Because science, to understand a whole system, it's becoming more and more important for different types of scientists to work together to make progress on understanding the environment. So we're going to start off with um, Dr. Skip Walker. He's a plant ecologist, and he's going to provide an overview of the project. So will be followed by Dr. Martha Reynolds, who's also a plant ecologist, and she's going to introduce us to the satellite data and talk about logistics associated with the fieldwork of this project. Next, Dr. Vladimir Romanovsky. He's a ge permafrost geophysicist, and he's going to tell us, um, present some new findings that he's found about what's happening to the permafrost in uh, northern part of North America. Then Dr. J.J. Frost, who's also a plant ecologist, will talk about um, uh, alder, uh, pattern ground and alders and shrub development that he's documented in Eurasia. Next will be Ronald, Dr. Ronald Dannon, who is a um, cold climate hydrologist. And he's going to talk about how the hydrology interacts with the permafrost and the vegetation. Next will be Dr. Ina Timlin, who's a microbial ecologist. And she's going to tell us about the fungi part of the story. And I'm going to end, I'm an atmospheric scientist uh, or a climate scientist. And I'm going to end scaling out into the panarctic view of what's happening to the climate associated with vegetation. So let's go skip. Thanks, Uma. So um, let's see. I Go first. Yes, I'd, I'd like to just give you uh, a brief overview of what this project was conceived as and uh, sort of some of the background that you may need to for some of the later talks. So <clears throat> I think the first thing we need to realize is that uh, the Arctic has a lot of definitions. And the one that we use as biologists is the area which is covered by tundra vegetation, it lacks trees. And th this figure shows the what we call the zonation of the Arctic. Uh, it's been divided into bioclimate subzones. There's five subzones represented on this map. The coldest areas of the Arctic are the purple areas in the far north, and the warmest areas are the red ones in the south. And there's a quite a nice gradient which we were focusing on to, to do this research. The, uh, one of the drivers was how is all this pattern of tundra that we see related to the presence of sea ice on the Arctic Ocean? And uh, the white area is the extent of where the ice is at the end of summer, at the beginning of the fall season, and uh, when the winter starts again. The light blue area shows the full extent uh, at the end of the winter uh, when you have maximum sea ice extent. And uh, so there's the summer extent. There's the late summer ice extent. And you see that there are some areas that are uh, surrounded by ice all year round. Those are the really, really cold areas of the Arctic, uh, what we call subzone A. And uh, you see that almost all of the area of the Arctic, which is shown in green here, is has presence of sea ice sometime during the uh, sometime during the year. You can really think of the tundra as being controlled by the presence of sea ice. Uh, if it wasn't for sea ice, the tundra wouldn't exist. We'd have forest all the way to the coast. So our, one of our questions is, what happens if you lose the sea ice, the summer sea ice, the perennial sea ice? And uh, this has been predicted by modelers to uh, possibly occur in our lifetimes, some of our lifetimes. And uh, so this is a very intriguing possibility. We may see a very different Arctic in a, within, our, our, within the, our lifespan. So one of the, one of the questions that uh, popped up from, this is some early research that we did. It was published in 2003, which was derived from satellite data. And Martha's going to tell you a little bit about how that, those data are derived. But well, what it's showing is, I talked about this, the various subzones. Well, this shows the trend 
in each of those subzones in a, a, a factor we call NDVI, which is, can, you can think of as greening, a greening index. And we see over the course of this study from 1981 to 2001, 20 years, about a 17% increase, which we can extrapolate actually means a pretty high percentage increase in the amount of biomass in the tundra. Uh, uh, about a 17% increase, which really surprised us. And so we wrote a proposal and we said, uh, you know, these are the questions, some of the questions that was driving that research. Are we seeing these trends elsewhere in Alaska? Because that, that previous graph just showed, or uh, elsewhere in the Arctic, the previous graph just showed you Alaska. And is there correspondence between what we're seeing from space, the satellite view, with what's occurring on the ground. Can we actually measure what's going on on the ground and see what these trends mean? And then what, what about other pieces of this puzzle of what, uh, what's going on in the Arctic with permafrost, with some of the sh spread of shrubs, um, the biodiversity of the Arctic? All of these questions we were interested in and some of them we were able to actually approach with uh, various parts of this study. And finally, does the greening correspond to the changes in climate? And Uma at the end will address this question. So th these are really complex questions. They seem rather simple, but they're, they're, they require a lot of people and a lot of logistics to answer them. Uh, to do this, we, we established two transects, one in North America, which went along the Dalton Highway up through the Canadian High Arctic, and the other was in Eurasia. And that Fingers sticking up is the Amal Peninsula, traversed the Amal Peninsula and went to Franz Josef Land. We had about 10 years of research that, uh, and about 37 or more people involved, uh, and uh, they were from five different countries. So it involved getting all these people into the field, working together uh, on pieces of ground that we, we selected and measuring a lot of parameters really over fairly short periods of time because we could only support this many people in the field for relatively uh, short periods. So this is an area in uh, the Franz Joseph land that we worked on. Um, all of these sorts of studies, we were trying to link what we were seeing from satellites with what was being measured on the ground. So we had climate and permafrost studies. Um, soils and soil fungi studies, and then a lot of studies related to vegetation and spectral measurements, which means just picture, uh, how the ground reflects light and energy. And uh, we were doing that with handheld spectrometers. I was involved mostly with the vegetation piece. We were looking at the uh, diversity of species and the amount of biomass. Uh, we would just clip out look, small pieces of tundra and, uh, and then sort out all the components of the tundra and weigh it, and uh, we came up with uh, measurements of biomass, how much of phytomass is on per area of tundra. These are just pictures along the two transects in each of the subzones. The coldest areas are on the left side and the warmest areas, and you can see a natural trend of greening along that gradient that uh, exists naturally. And uh, you can see that the, the, the uh, trends look pretty similar. We see sort of similar environments in the, uh, along the Eurasian transect on the top and the North American transect on the bottom. This is the biomass data. It sh shows somewhat similar trends along both. Uh, we have a, you know, about 800 grams per meter squared of uh, biomass in the warmest parts of the Arctic and less than uh, 200 meters or grams per meter squared in the southern part. And, uh, but there are also a lot of differences and we were really interested in what, what causes the differences. And I think what we, what we really came to realize that a lot of this is due to disturbances of many different types. Here you see an area on the Amal Peninsula. This is the Russian uh, area where there's a lot of landslides. Uh, every stream is covered with landslides. And it creates these really interesting patterns of vegetation that have variations in greenness and NDVI across, NDVI across these disturbance gradients. This is a, 
a slide that shows the trend in shrub cover as you move from north, the coldest area on the left, to the warmest areas on the right. And we see large differences in shrub abundance and size of shrubs as you move along that gradient. And you also notice there's a ch change in the, in the substrate, in the sort of the micro topography that's associated with differences in the permafrost regime along that gradient. So both, uh, well, three in the middle here, we'll be talking about various aspects of that, the permafrost relationships and how that affects vegetation patterns. One of the big things we'll be talking about is changes in ice wedges and the active layer. Ice wedges are what you see in this photograph here. This is Link Washburn, who is probably the father of geocryology, which is the study of, of um, the landforms and the uh, uh, related to ice in the ground. And uh, there's a very interesting process that goes on with forming these ice wedges. I don't have time to talk about it. Maybe Vlad will say a little bit about it, but we're exposing these now. And what he's pointing to at the top there is what's called the active layer. That piece is the piece that is thawing every year. And it, in some years, it thaws down to the top of the uh, top of the ice wedge. And there's very interesting things going on now because we're reaching that threshold where we're thawing into the ice wedges, and that's causing major changes. And Vlad, Vlad will talk about that. Um, the, uh, this is the pattern that we see when we fly over the tundra. These are ice wedge polygons. They're formed by the ground contracting in the wintertime, very cold temperatures. And uh, then they, they fill with water, the cracks fill with water, and we see uh, these, these very interesting patterns. And uh, Vlad will focus on those. The other pattern that we'll be looking at are what's called uh, frost boils, or non-sorted circles. And here you see one on the ground on the left. Uh, this is at Prudhoe Bay. The, if you look at this area from, from an aircraft, you see something like what's on the right, which is called, uh, in Russian, uh, the equivalent term is spotted tundra, which is a really good descriptive term for that. These are actually very <coughs> common features. They're practically everywhere in the Arctic. Sometimes they're masked uh, by vegetation, and sometimes they're not. But you can see a natural pattern of greeting associated with those features. So we've got a lot of pieces to this puzzle. And uh, the people that will follow me uh, will we'll proceed from maps of vegetation and greenness, which uh, Martha Reynolds will talk about, permafrost and pattern ground, Vlad. We'll go to shrubs and uh, what's happening with shrubs in relationship to pattern ground. And then to some models of actually how these things form and what they, how they change. And then Ina will kind of bring us down and focus at a very fine scale with soil fungi and then Uma's going to zoom out to outer space, and we're going to see uh, the whole Arctic and the climate drivers. So the next speaker is uh, Martha. Thanks. So uh, my name is Martha Reynolds, and I'm a plant ecologist. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we go from understanding what's growing on the ground to then being able to make maps and understand what the satellites are telling us about Arctic vegetation. This landscape is very complex. We've got all of these, as Skip was saying, these uh, polygons and um, patterns that are showing up at this scale that you can see from the air and also on the ground, very fine scaled patterns. So how do you deal with this kind of complexity when you're trying to understand, first of all, what's there and how it might be changing or have changed in the past? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to get to know the plants. And the only way to do this is to spend time on the tundra. And people can teach you plants, and you can look at them in books, but you just have to spend the time getting to know the plants themselves. And then once you've done that, then you can start considering mapping them. And uh, here's my friend, Dr. Anya Kata. She's in the audience here someplace, mapping on a one meter scale. So this is one by one meter. And if you have a nice meter grid there, you can see how you might map this vegetation and create this type of map. And here you've got the, the light gray is the barren areas, and the darker gray has a cryptogamic crust with lichens and mosses growing on it. And then the pink is, is more, uh, the more vegetated area. 
And so that's how you can do it on the, at the very uh, small scale. Here, if you've got a, a 10 by 10 meter grid, you can still do the same kind of thing, where you can walk around the whole thing. You can look at every single one meter square and start to map it. You can also, at this scale, it's sometimes useful to use an aerial photo. This is taken from a helicopter, and it shows your 10 by 10 meter grid. And then doing that, with that information, you can create a map. So we've got a map here of the 10 by 10 meters, again, with the same type of pattern that uh, we saw in the 1 by 1 meter, with the uh, gray is the less vegetated, and the pink and the yellow are the more vegetated areas. And this is, the map then displays nicely that type of frost boil scale um, pattern ground that Skip was describing. Well, if you want to get into a bigger scale, uh, then that's where we start to use satellite data. So this image here shows the area around Tulik Lake. And um, the road, the Dalton Highway, comes in from the bottom, takes the bend, and goes out the upper right. And the lake that's right at that bend is Tulik Lake. It's a place with a uh, research station uh, where a lot of Arctic scientists will go and, and study. And uh, so there's quite a bit known from this area. So we've got a lot of ground data. But you, as you can imagine, even though this is a very well-known part of the Arctic, you can't walk over every square meter here. And so you have to do some interpretation of what you see with the satellite data. But you can produce a map. And as you'll see, this is a, the same kind of map, um, sort of a hierarchical scale from the small one meter map um, to the, the area around Tulik Lake. And, and the uh, yellow here represents tussock tundra. So you can see it's a very common vegetation type here. So I'm going to make a, uh, take a slight uh, digression here to explain NDVI, which is a term that Skip has uh, mentioned a couple times. And uh, it, it won't take long, but there are some graphs. So if uh, you could just close your eyes for a little bit. <laughs> uh, well, the normalized, NDVI is this normalized difference vegetation index. And it takes advantage of the fact that um, the plants absorb a lot of radiation in the red part of the spectrum. And so here on the y-axis, we've got what the satellite is seeing. So what's ref the percentage of the incoming radiation that's coming to the Earth that's reflected back to the satellite. And the plants are absorbing in the red because that's where they photosynthesize. That's the energy that they use. They, because of the structure within a leaf, they reflect in the near infrared. And so if you take the difference between the red and the near infrared, and it's a big difference, that means it's likely to be a plant. And so if you compare um, here the uh, difference for some plants, you get a quite a large difference, whereas soil or water, you get a very small difference between the red and infrared reflect reflectance. And then what we do to get the normalized part of this normalized difference vegetation index is divide by the sum of the two. And that what that does is it makes, um, if the sun is coming from different angles or you have some variation, it normalizes for that. So that's what this NDVI is. And here's a picture of what it, the whole Arctic looks like if you take that NDVI um, data. <clears throat> and you're getting quite a, you can see quite a, a, a range. The darker green is more veg vegetated. And we took that data and then we combined that with the biomass data that uh, Skip was showed being collected along those two transects in North America and in Eurasia. And the graph here shows on the left-hand side, you've got the NDVI. And on the, uh, the x-axis, you've got phytomass, which is the above ground plant biomass. And then we drew a line through the data. And you'll see there's a very strong relationship between the two. And so we were able to take the NDVI map and we can produce a, phyto, a, a biomass map and actually have a pretty good idea of how much plant material there is in these throughout the Arctic. And it was this kind of data that we were then able to use over time. And Uma will show you some of the trends over time in Arctic plant biomass. And so we've got an idea of, of, of what's, what's growing where and how it's been changing over the satellite, uh, the, the realm of the satellite data since the 1980s. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you is a little bit about the logistics of getting a crew like ours. And this, what we have here tonight is just a very small sample of the actual number of people that we are trying to get into the Arctic. These are very remote places. We have to bring all of our food, our tents, all of our sampling equipment, and of course, all the people themselves. And uh, 
it, it, it adds up to piles and piles and piles of stuff. And we've gone up there using uh, trucks. We've used airplanes. And of course, all of these vehicles need their own fuel. So you have to bring the fuel because you're going some, and they have to carry back the empty barrels. And uh, we've used helicopters. Uh, we've used trains. And to get to the farthest north parts in, uh, in Russia, to get to Franz Josef Land, there is even a Russian icebreaker involved in this project. And mostly it goes quite smoothly, but we have had a few glitches. And this was a uh, two weeks earlier when the planes had landed us in Elif Ringnes. Uh, the runway was fairly hard, but when they came back two weeks later, they thought they could use a larger plane, and uh, it didn't work out so well. But we did get it out of there. We all got back. And uh, now I'll pass it on to uh, Dr. Vladimir Romanovsky. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Vladimir Romanovsky, uh, working at the Geophysical Institute, and I'm studying permafrost for the last 35 years. So um, what I would like to show uh, is some uh, interesting results from, from this project. Um, because of this project, we were extremely uh, lucky to go to these places um, up north, and this is uh, uh, Canadian archipelago part of our transect, North American transect. And I will be talking mostly about this place, Isaacson. It's about 70, 79 north, and also a little bit about Green Cabin. So we were lucky to go there in uh, uh, earlier uh, 2000s and then come back uh, seven, uh, six, seven, eight years later and see what is going on on the ground. Not from the airplane, looking from the airplane, not uh, from satellites, but uh, right on the ground. And that uh, was uh, how it looked like, this area in Isaacson, uh, in the, our first trips on 2006. A uh, pretty smooth area, uh, close to the close view on the ground, very flat. Um, and we knew that there is lots of ice wedges, ice in the ground. But and we, uh, so, some digging uh, showed this uh, huge ice wedges, which are several meters across, maybe uh, like five meters across, and pretty close to the ground surface. However, you cannot see anything uh, from the surface. So f surface was pretty pretty much flat. Even we know that there is lots of ice under this surface. And this is one of this uh, site of uh, what uh, uh, Marta was just talking about in 2005. So when we came there in 2013, so that's exactly the same plot. So go back. You know, this plot, our flags became white, of course, from red, just you know, because of uh, harsh weather there. But the surface changed completely. So instead of this flat, nice uh, uh, plain surface, we have lots of hummocks there, lots of troughs, uh, some uh, ups, and, uh, and, and, and surface completely uneven now. So uh, I just show several photographs, the same plot from different sites, so you can see from uh, different angles uh, how this flat surface change. Uh, we also have uh, uh, installed there some uh, temperature measurements for in the ground uh, and also air temperature. And so, and that's how uh, this our station looked uh, in 2005. So in 2000, and this is uh, uh, just the same area in 2005. In 2013. This, this changed completely. So for all these uh, eight years, uh, this station survived uh, polar bears, uh, harsh climate, uh, and worked perfectly. We collect all data from this, but it, it may not survive changes in, in permafrost. So it, it seems like it's already kind of uh, leaning on the side, and, and hopefully it will stay there for, for a little bit longer. And now we have actually uh, uh, real-time data f uh, uh, coming from the station. We don't need to go there anymore, which is pity, I think. Um, so uh, uh, that's another uh, you know, trough going just through, through, the, through the, uh, our station. So and uh, and again, uh, it, it's good also that during uh, 2005, I had a little bit of time to look what is under the, these flat surfaces. Uh, oh yeah, and, oh, sorry, that's that's another example. Uh, this is oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is uh, another site close to the previous one uh, with a little bit drier surfaces, uh, 2005, and in 2013. 
the, this this uh, plot is still pretty flat. However, again, huge trough developed right there, and um, it, th I had a little bit of time during this trip, 2005, uh, and I decided to to dig a little bit uh, in spare time and find this ice wedge and see what how it looked like. It was like I said, it was very difficult to find a uh, location where it is, but I just follow a little bit of a little bit more moss on the surface. And I, I dug a small uh, trench and I found ice. So I found uh, the, this ice wedge about 48 centimeters, about a uh, uh, foot and a half, um, from the surface down to the, to the top of the ice wedge. It looks like this. And this number, 48, is very important. So it means that during the last several tens, maybe hundreds, maybe even thousands of year, years, uh, this summer thaw layer never penetrated deeper than, than this, this depth and allowed to develop this big, big ice wedge. Now, uh, right uh, at the, the uh, trench, what I dug, uh, was about somewhere right here. So, and now the surface looks completely different. So the question is, uh, well, a little bit earlier. Uh, question is, what happened? So how to explain it? And I have two, two explanations, two versions. So the so first one is, well, uh, there are lots of people were there and walking around and trampling and, and probably disturbed the, the area and then it started to kind of uh, uh, falling apart. However, uh, against this hypothesis is that nobody was allowed in, uh, in boots on the, on the grids. So people actually has to take boots off to go on the grid. So it, the trampling was minimal. And another thing is that this kind of things happen not only on these plots and not only in the area we were working on, but also in the whole area around it. So it's not probably not good explanation. So another explanation is, uh, of course, climate change. Right? And uh, we have some, some support for this uh, hypothesis. So because of that station, what I showed you, we could measure uh, temperature uh, air temperature, surface temperature during all this period of time. And what we found that during this time, uh, between our visits, um, the, uh, so the number of so-called degree days, or thaw degree days, it's temperature, some of the temperature above freezing point uh, during the whole summer, increased dr tremendously. So compared to norm, which was, uh, and also we have some previous records from station near to that, the, the norm is about 200. So during this period of time between our visits, and actually in our visit it was cold again, but between them, this amount of degree days was twice or even, even three times more than it was normal. So because of that, <clears throat> The active layer thickness, which is the depth of the maximum depth of summer thaw, was again much higher during this period of time between our visits. And remember this 48 centimeters line. So actually, most of the of the uh, years during the, the, those summers, the the thaw was deeper than the top of the active uh, of the ice wedge. And of course, these wedges start to melt. Ice started to melt, and because it's just water running away, surface subsidence, subsides, and that's what we have as a result. As a result, we have development of this, of this kind of uh, features on the ground surface. So I think this is a little bit better explanation than, than trampling. A uh, very similar picture we saw in the uh, island a little bit south, down south, Banks Island. Uh, that's a place where we worked 2003 and 2004, and that's how it looked like. You can see some kind of troughs here already, but they're pretty small and, and not really well developed, uh, and also there is no difference in vegetation. So when we came there on 2013, so the same troughs, they look like this now. So at least 20 centimeters or 30 centimeters sometimes even surface uh, in these troughs is lower than it was during that time. 
And also you can see that it's vegeta vegetated much more. So uh, that's part of this greening actually story that vegetation start to develop in these troughs because of much better condi growing conditions for for this uh, for the for these plants. Uh, and this is even even more dramatic example. Is some kind of you can see already some running water here doing some erosion. So lots of things going on there. Uh, and uh, I think that is end of my short story. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks, Vlad, and uh, thanks to all of you for attending tonight's talks. My name is JJ Frost, and I'm a plant ecologist. I've been working in the Arctic for about 15 years, uh, mostly here in Alaska, but also uh, over in Russia. And uh, my talk is, is again, we're going to continue to talk about patterned ground and, and vegetation and greening, but we're going to move from the high Arctic, uh, which we just heard about, down to the low Arctic. And by that, we mean the area of tundra that's right close to the boreal forest or the northern tree line. And again, in these environments, patterned ground is, is sort of, a, as I state here in the title, is really a focal point of, of change in vegetation in the Arctic. So uh, in recent decades, there's pretty compelling evidence that uh, Arctic landscapes are changing quite a lot. And a lot of those changes have to do with uh, permafrost or see various forms of, of uh, change sort of spectacularly depicted in that cartoon. Um, but basically, all of these forms of permafrost thawing processes, landslides, et cetera, um, change patterns of drainage on the tundra. So uh, moisture conditions change. And of course, these larger scale changes in summer temperature and climate are really affecting the growing conditions for, for plants. So really one of the most, uh, well, widespread changes that we're seeing are increases in tall shrub and to some extent tree abundance uh, as you approach that northern tree line. And these changes can happen pretty quickly just over the course of a few decades. But until recently, most of the, our knowledge of this process has really come from northern Alaska and other sites in North America. And uh, there's really a, been a big gap in our knowledge for the expanse of uh, northern Siberia. And uh, as we've heard, logistics is a big consideration in this sort of work. So why is there a gap in Siberia? Well, it's a tough place to get to. Lots of logistical challenges and, of course, lots of uh, political challenges, too. Um, so in my work, I've kind of overcome that um, using the eye in the sky. And in fact, uh, some of the, the earliest forms of satellite observation going back to the early space age. And uh, during the Cold War in the 1960s, of course, there were a lot of really rapid innovations. And one of those was the Corona and Gambit um, satellite surveillance systems. And these were the very first Earth observing high resolution satellites. And of course, it was top secret in those days. Um, it's declassified imagery now. You can all look at it. Um, but uh, you get some idea of how the technology worked. Uh, it worked using Kodak film. They launched uh, these satellites. The film was exposed. And then it was actually re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and was recovered in midair. It's a wonder that it, that it worked at all, but it actually worked extremely well. And uh, we, of course, this was the main, the main application for this imagery was monitoring Soviet military capabilities. And you get some idea of the resolution. Not bad for 1966 from space. But uh, nowadays, this imagery is a great resource for people like me who are interested in looking at landscape change. And we're looking at an area in northwest Siberia, landscape of rolling hills and ponds. And you see these dark patches on the hills, and these are, these are alder. Um, it's the same alder that we're all too familiar with here in Alaska. Um, but this is great imagery. It, we get a picture of the landscape in 1966. And now, of course, today, uh, high resolution satellite imagery is really easy to come by. You can look at this image on Google Earth. And uh, it allows us to just take a look at what did the land, we know what the landscape looked like about 45 years ago, and what does it look like now? And just a quick look at these images, if we flip back and forth, you can see that the abundance of these alder shrubs has really uh, increased a lot um, on the landscape just over a few decades. So uh, my work, I'm going to focus primarily on a site here, CARP. But I did look at a series of landscapes right at the forest tundra transition across northern Siberia using this uh, declassified imagery. And the overall story is that it, 
at least most of these landscapes, tree and shrub abundance has increased pretty substantially just over a fairly short period of time. But interestingly, if you look at any one of these landscapes, what you'd find is not just sort of an even spread of trees and shrubs, but rather very concentrated pockets of change uh, that are in some parts of the landscape and other parts of the landscape are unchanged. And that's, uh, it's really important to get at what's creating that sort of variability if we want to understand where these landscapes are headed uh, in the future. So to do that, um, we got the, we used the tool, the satellite tool, and now we're going to get into the field. And of course, again, people in logistics, uh, it, it figures into all of this sort of work. And, um, interesting camp setup we had there, weathered the storm. And of course, getting to these places, we saw a DC-3 stuck in the mud. We've got a tank stuck in the river. I just want to, I always got a kick out of the mascot on this phase of the trip. But we did manage to get, had our whole field camp on that thing, but we got it out and got into the field. And uh, when we got there, I thought I knew this landscape pretty well looking at it in the satellite imagery, but was really excited to see these really abundant pattern ground features. And here we're not talking about uh, ice wedge polygons. These are what I'll call frost boils. And they're pretty small, but you see the, the beautiful symmetrical patterns they form on the landscape, these little barren patches surrounded by vegetation. Very abundant there. And it became really obvious early on uh, that uh, these were the places that were changing the most. This is where alders coming in. You see these young shrubs popping up on these little barren frost boils. So we're really bringing in uh, one of the main forms of vegetation change and a driver of greening, the shrubs, uh, with these pattern ground landscapes. That was really exciting. So what's going on with these frost boils? Our next speaker, Ronnie Danen, is going to talk to us a little more about these features, but I'll give you some idea. You see this strong sorting of material on the surface, and if we look at it in cross-section with a soil pit, um, we see that there's this very strong sorting of soil material that occurs over time, and that's all due to seasonal freezing and thawing. And in cross-section, basically, you've got a lot of fine, all the fine textured material is concentrated under the frost boils, and uh, to the sides, you have, in, in this case, a rockier material, and that's basically the vegetation develops over the, the rocky material. And that vegetation serves as, as insulation, essentially. So um, what's happening is that if we go into the early winter period as the ground freezes downward, that freezing happens very quickly under these bare frost boils and not so quickly beneath the vegetation. Basically, that uh, draws water towards the freezing front as it moves down. And then that water is available to form ice lenses uh, in the subsurface. And that essentially, you form a lot of ice under these features, and it literally pushes the surface upward. And we call that differential frost heave, but I'll stay, try and stay away from the jargon. Um, but what, what all that means is that this soil pocket here is very disturbed. It's getting churned, basically, and there's this pronounced uh, sort of physical disturbance that happens every year. And that's the reason they're barren. It's difficult for plants to get established there. They're getting uprooted. So if, um, interestingly enough, these, places, these sites that have remained unvegetated for a long time are exactly the same places where these big shrubs are coming in and really changing the complexion of the landscape. Uh, this is a very common observation. We see this young shrub, and you see these sort of really uh, deformed roots. The thing is, the shrub's been disturbed by this um, frost eve process. But nonetheless, these shrubs, and I think we can probably relate to this in our common experience with alder, it likes disturbance. You know, we see it along roadsides. You see it in old disturbed areas, old pipeline camps. Um, you know, it grows quickly, and it's, it's really tough. So basically, these, uh, apparently, these frost boils are actually really good sites for seedling development. And uh, the Basically, the shrubs grow fast enough that they uh, are able to become established and get big despite that, that disturbance. So here's an aerial view, and I think this illustrates pretty vividly the role that shrubs have and that pattern ground has in this phenomenon of greening. Um, this is an area in northern Alaska, and you can see all these bare frost boils. But what's happening is that they're getting covered by these big shrubs. So obviously, if you go from a landscape that's covered in these you know, partially vegetated areas, and suddenly now they're supporting these big shrubs, well, there's a big driver for greening, and one that has a, a lot of implications for what these landscapes look like and how they function. So with that, uh, I'll just wrap things up, and we'll hear a little more about frost boils from, uh, from Ronnie.
Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you, JJ, for the good introduction for my talk. Um, my name is uh, Ronald Dannen. I work at the Alaska Geological Survey. And uh, I'm going to talk about patterned ground and how it uh, affects potentially the greening. Patterned ground is a natural form of disturbance. And you can see here in the north a fine pattern of uh, cracking. Further south, you see the cracking changing into bigger circles. And down here is even further south. This is northern Alaska, where you see a frost boil that is nice bare. But sometimes these frost boils can go green. And the question is, uh, how can climate change, how does climate change affect this process? So we are focusing more on the southern Arctic here, right around Franklin Bluffs and not so much um, on the very high northern part. Here's another sketch of the situation. So you have in the north, again, fine cracking features that slowly change into frost boils. But eventually, they will be completely vegetated, and then we actually call them uh, frost mounts. And so if we are interested in that shift from non-vegetated to vegetated, we really need to understand what keeps them non-vegetated. And so if we take a stretch of tundra uh, that is green, which is vegetated, but you have these bare patches, just like uh, JJ also showed, this is the frost boil. And in terms of processes, the vegetation really affects the organic material in the soil. The thickness of the organic material really affects how deep the soil thaws. We saw from Vladimir also that um, in the very high north there is uh, very little vegetation. And so um, if the climate changes, the summer thaw gets deeper very quickly. Then there's the story of snow. In the tundra, there's a lot of blowing snow. And so when you have a bare surface, the snow doesn't really uh, accumulate very much. If you have shrubs, if you have uh, roughness, plants, the snow accumulates and it becomes a lot thicker. This affects, in the fall, the amount of heat that gets extracted from the soil. Uh, so you get more heat coming out of the frost boils than you do from the vegetation. That results in a faster freezing front in the frost boils. That causes this water to start migrating through cryostatic suction. And that creates these ice lenses. And the ice lenses is really what keeps the frost boil from becoming vegetated. So. If these are the processes that are describing the system, and we want to know how various parts of these processes affect the system as a whole, we can actually program a numerical model to simulate this. And down here at the bottom, you see from a bird's eye view uh, a cube of tundra. and with vegetated simulated on top over 861 years. And you see that the model actually forms a frost boil within that cube of soil. I didn't tell it to do that. It actually simulated it by itself based on these processes. Now, in viewing the system as in climate change, we want to know how various components of climate change potentially affect the patterned ground and the disturbance. So to show that, I have this image here, but in the center, a reference run with that model. On the left here, there's the effect of wetness on, on the patterned ground formation. In the center, in the, the uh, effect of temperature on the freezing speed, uh, or on the freezing of the soil. There is a simulation here scenario with um, active layer depth, different active layer depths, 
and a run with soil texture. Even though soil texture I'm not going to talk about today because we are talking about climate. Um, so the interesting part is that if you take a climate record from the reference and make it four degrees colder, it doesn't change very much. If you make it four degrees warmer, it also doesn't change very much. So the temperature, the direct effect of temperature of, on the freezing temperature on the system is very small. Active layer depth, however, seems to have a very strong effect. But unfortunately, we don't really know what active layer will be doing in the future with climate change. The biggest effect seems to be, and the clearest effect, of the wetness of the soil. So if you have drier conditions, it's more likely that these frost boils will become vegetated because it will produce less ice wedges and therefore less frost heave. And with that, I'll give it over to Ina, Dr. Ina Timling. My name is Ina Timling. I'm a microbial ecologist, and I am interested in the biodiversity and the distribution pattern of fungi in the Arctic. So one might ask the question, what do fungi have to do with greening of the Arctic? And the answer may lay in the fact that fungi interact with plants in many different ways. To begin with, fungi are ubiquitous. They occur nearly everywhere. As decomposers, they degrade plant material and release the nutrients into, back into the soil so that it can be taken up by other plants. Um, as parasitic fungi or pathogens, they take energy and nutrients from plants away and harm them. As mutualists, fungi can occur as lichens, where a fungus associates with an algae and they can, as mutualists, they can also occur as mycorrhizae, where a fungus associates with the roots of plants. And um, the purpose of these mutualistic fungi in general provide nutrients to their symbiotic uh, partners. And with that, fungi affect the occurrence of other organisms, including plants that contribute to greening to the, of the Arctic. So while there are many different forms of mycorrhizae, um, mycorrhizae, one that is very important in the Arctic is the ectomycorrhizae. And here in this ectomycorrhizae, a fungus associates with a shrub, like this willow here, and the fungus covers the root tips and the fungal hyphae extend into the soil. What that means, these fungal hyphae extend the root systems massively. And the whole purpose of this mutualistic ben um, relationship is that they benefit each other by exchanging resources. So the plant obtains nutrients and water from the fungus, and the fungus obtains carbohydrates from the plants. And with this, the fungus can complete its life cycle. The fungus depends on a host. And the, and the willow, in this case, or the shrubs, they can grow bigger. So in order to do my work, I went out and I collected soils and lots of roots from shrubs along the North American Arctic transect. I extracted DNA. I extracted DNA and I sequenced the fungi out of these DNA extracts. So what did we find? Using molecular methods, we found many more species than had been previously um, reported. We found that in the Arctic, there are, fun, there are a few fungal families um, that are really species rich. And this slide here shows you representative fungi of these um, fungal families. Species 
species richness of vascular plants and mammals usually declines um, with latitude. So the further north you go, the fewer you find. When we looked at the fungi, we found that um, in contrast to this very common pattern, um, fungal species richness that did not decline with latitude. That means we find the, about the same number of fungi in the coldest areas as in the warmest areas. From temperate climates, we know that when shrubs or trees grow together or in, in vicinity, they usually have different fungi growing on their roots. In contrast, in the Arctic, when you have different shrubs growing together, they shared a large portion of the same fungi. So basically, the same fungi grew at large at, uh, at these different um, shrubs. So that suggests that the relationship between the fungus and the shrub is not very specific in the Arctic. And it could potentially facilitate the establishment of shrubs in areas where there are no shrubs at the moment. Finally, um, along this bioclimatic gradient, we found two very unique subzones or two unique areas, and these were the warmest area um, or, and the coldest area. So the, mo the most southern area and the uh, most northern area. And in the warmest area, we found that 84% of the fungi that were there were unique to this area. They did not occur in other regions of the Arctic. When we took these um, unique fungi and compared them to a data set from the boreal forest, we found that about two, um, 73 percent, so three quarters, um, occurred also in the boreal forest. That suggests that potentially if the tree line expands, these trees that um, germinate could germinate in the tundra would have already their fungal host bed there. Um, and in regard to the coldest subzone, it was unique in that um, there were no host plants growing in this area that are necessary for these ectomycorrhizal fungi to live. However, in our DNA extracts, we found um, these ectomycorrhizal fungi. And we suspect that these come from spores that were in the ground. Um, so if these spores are viable and if the climate permits, these fungi that are already present in the soil could facilitate the establishment of shrubs in this most northern region and therefore could contribute to the greening of the Arctic in this region. Thank you very much. So now we're going to zoom out and talk about the climate on a pan-Arctic scale. So one of my favorite um, pieces of information here was that 80% of the tundra is within 60 miles of the ocean. So it really shouldn't come as a surprise that it's, the tundra vegetation is very closely linked to sea ice. And Skip has already told us a little bit about that. So since it's very closely linked to sea ice, if we look at sea ice over the last 30 years over the period of the satellite record. We start in the late 70s when the satellite record started. This is the minimum sea ice extent, the, the area over the Arctic. It's declined until the mid 90s and then it's declined a bit more precipitously. So we would argue that there's likely a link. So now we're gonna look at spatial patterns of trends. This is the trend of springtime sea ice over a 31 year period, all from satellites. Same data that was used to make that previous plot. And everything that's blue says that the sea ice in the springtime goes away faster. So when the sea ice goes away faster in the springtime, that lets the land warm up even more or more quickly. And again, that uh, 
provides warmth, which is what the tundra plants need to get going. The one place that's kind of interesting is in the Bering Sea, there you can see the purple. There's been actually an increase over the last few years of sea ice in the Bering Sea. It has to do with local circulations, but not really a focus of today's talk. On the right-hand panel, we have summer warmth. And this is in the summer warmth index adds up all the warmth available during the course of the summer. So it's an integral of June, July, May, June, July, August. And the bigger that number, there's more warmth available for plants. And as this warmth increases, there, the plants have the potential to, to grow bigger and have more biomass. So the trend in the summer warmth index over this period the red show increases. So overall, it is increasing in the Arctic. It's increasing a lot around Greenland. And it's increasing moderately in Alaska and Chukotka. We see some negatives. So these are declines. So it's actually been cooling over western Siberia and the southern part of the tundra in, in northern Canada. Now, the next slide shows how does the, the NDVI, which Martha has already introduced to you, the, veg, the measure of vegetation productivity from space. And these are the trends of the NDVI over the 82 to 2012 period. The greens mean the biomass is increasing. And overall, over most of the Arctic, we see more green than anything else. We do see some browns. We see some declines over here in western Siberia. Co coincident with the area where there is um, cooling during the summertime, we also see uh, declines in southwestern Alaska. And you probably don't remember the previous picture, but it actually has warmed during the summer. So it's warmed, yet it's, uh, the vegetation is declining. And we're trying to understand what's going on by talking to people locally about that. And right now, we don't have an answer. We've been struggling. So now if we average over the whole Arctic, I'd like to show you some time series of how this has varied over time. This is a plot that shows the summer warmth starting in 1982 up to 2012. And what's happened with summer warmth is it's increased until the mid late 90s. And from the late 90s onward, there's actually been a decline. So overall, the summer has been cooling for the Arctic. And we're, you know, what's going on? If we look at this measure called time integrated NDVI, what this is is it's the sum of the NDVI over the whole summer. So we're looking at both starting in spring when the plants start growing, we just add up all the biweekly NDVI. So you can think of it as an overall summer view. It actually matches the summer warmth index very well. It increases until roughly 2000, and then it's been declining. So what this says is that something's happening probably in spring and fall that's making the plants not green up as quickly, and it's probably related to snow. But we've been struggling. There isn't a good snow data set that we have. So we haven't been able to show this, but we're working on it. If we look at maximum NDVI or peak NDVI, so this is the peak value it gets over the summer, that has continued to increase. So the plants are becoming more productive, but things are happening at this edge of the season. So now I you know, said it's been cooling in the Arctic, but we need to put that into perspective. You know, when you look at trends over short periods, it can be somewhat misleading, you know, either if you're talking about warming or cooling. So if we look at a summer warmth index based on meteorological station data that goes back to the 30s from Russia, there's a lot of variability in the Arctic, but overall, the summer warmth has been increasing until the last decade. So even though we're at, we've had a decline, we're still at a fairly high point of our observational record, so keep that in mind. And another thing we've been looking at is there's meteorology involved in what's leading to this warming. And if we look at sea level pressure, sea level pressure tells us something about the circulation of the atmosphere. In this left panel, we, this is an average summertime sea level pressure pattern. So the pressure tends to be lower in the central Arctic, lower over the continents during an average summer. There's a high at, on the north of Alaska the, called the Beaufort High. And this is what the average pressure looks like. But if we look at the sea level pressure over the last, since 98, 99, or um, over the period where we see that cooling in the summer warmth, this is the pattern that we get. So it's a difference between the most recent pattern minus the earlier pattern. How has the sea level pressure changed over the last 
15 years compared to before. What we see is we have above average pressure over Greenland and the Central Arctic, and we have lower pressure around the continents. And our interpretation of that is that when you have low pressure, you tend to have more cloudiness. So what's happened is the climate has warmed, the sea ice has declined enough that now we have more moisture available, either locally or being transported. So we have more clouds, and that's probably explaining some of our cooling. And in this region where we have above normal pressure, a high pressure, which is when we get our clear skies like today, it's been clearer and there's, it's continued to warm around Greenland and it's, um, the NDVI keeps, has been increasing. So there's a lot of heterogeneity about what's going on in the Arctic because of changes in circulation. So then to end our presentations, there's a few things we'd like you to remember. First of all, there's many factors involved in this Arctic uh, impact that impact greening of the Arctic. The warmer climate has led to reduced sea ice. Once the sea ice goes away, it actually helps to warm the climate more again. Um, the permafrost deg degradation changes the, the viability of where plants can grow, as does changes in pattern ground. And this leads to the shrub expansion, which is where the greening we see at the ground matches what we see from satellites. Uh, changes in frost heave also changes where plants are able to grow. And we know that the fungi are an important part of where the plants will be able to grow, that they will be necessary. And in general, you know, to summarize, we'd, we would argue that Greening, as we've seen by all these different types of analysis, has implications for those living in the Arctic. And we'll end with this slide saying, you know, how will this change, um, how will this impact the people of the Arctic? Thank you.